Good morning, Grace Blue Ridge family. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here on this rainy day. We're glad that you braved the weather to come out and worship with us this morning. And for those of you, well, I don't even know where to look. Oh, up here. <laughs> those of you watching from home, thanks for tuning in with us and for continuing to worship with us. Before we get started with announcements, I want to give you a minute to greet one another, to hug one another, to say hello, to meet somebody new or reconnect with someone you haven't seen in a while. And we'll be back in just a moment. All right, everybody. While you're getting settled in, I want to give you a little bit of an update um, of kind of about our vision as the staff and the session have been talking and praying about what does it mean for us to be uh, in our new, uh, new community, to kind of reestablish what it means to be family and to be together. We're really focusing heavily on the idea of community, physically being together, breaking bread, celebrating, having fun. Um, this is really important to us because you're here on Sundays, you're hearing the word, you're hearing the worship, you're being part of that. But what we've really missed over the last year and, and handful of months is the physical community together. So we're really emphasizing that in the coming months. And so you're going to hear a lot about opportunities to be together. Please, if you're not already, be on our weekly email list because that is how we tell you about upcoming things. Um, one thing we're wanting to do is let you know when we know about someone in our congregation who's maybe in a band or who has some sort of special event that they're hosting that they want you to be a part of and it's open to the, to the community, then we want to let you know about that. When we have cookouts or prayer requests or special events, you want to know about that. So if you're not on our weekly email, you can get on that by going to our website and filling out a Connect card or using the Church Center app, which I hope you all have because we're continuing to add more and more use for that awesome free app to keep you connected to the church. And so if you don't have that already, go ahead and download it and then be on our weekly email list so you know about those upcoming things. Also, we are in the period of nominations for new deacons and deaconesses. Um, that concludes on July 4th. So if you have been thinking and praying about who you would like to nominate to join this awesome team of servants who do all kinds of things around here at the church to, to provide for the needs of our, our building and our people and just to love um, our, our, and serve our church in a special way, if you know of someone that you think fits the bill for that, please talk to them and then nominate them in the next two weeks. And that nomination form is in the weekly email every single week. Also next week, speaking of community, we are going to be having a church-wide cookout. Hopefully the weather will be much nicer than today. <laughs> Otherwise, bring your poncho. Now, it's going to be great. We are going to have burgers and sides and drinks. You don't have to bring anything except yourself. 
Um, we would love to have you stay after church and hang out with us and worship with us. We'll have some tables set up under the tent, some in the sunshine. We've got some yard games, just some things for the kids to do and for adults to do so you're not just awkwardly standing around. Like, we want you to move around, get to know one another, talk, have fun. So that's happening next week. There is a registration open for that. It's just to help us have a head count. You don't have to register. We're going to obviously plan above and beyond. But if you don't mind taking a minute and letting us know, yep, I'm going to be there, that'll help us with planning purposes. Also, VBS registration is open. That's coming up pretty soon, July 5th, 19th, 21st, and 23rd. It'll be here before you know it, so um, that registration is available online as well. We'd love to have your child participate in that. Our Feed the Need summer initiative is going strong. Thank you so much for your donations already. Um, if you have a chance, uh, sneak back and take a look in the room right next to the bathrooms and the kitchen. You'll see the stockpile on what we're working on. Deb's been leading up that charge, and we're just so thankful for all the volunteers. We do need a few things this week. We need more jams and jellies, and we always need protein bars, oatmeal, and macaroni and cheese. So if you can throw a couple of those extra things in your cart this week, we'd really appreciate that. And we are excited to continue providing food for these food insecure families families that are right here in our, neighbor, in our neighborhood. Um, lastly, I want to remind you that um, we have our friends, uh, Peter and Justina, are visiting today. Hi, guys. And they are back um, for the summer, and they're going to be joining us again on July 25th, I believe is the date, um, to share about what they've been doing uh, in their work in sub-Saharan Africa. Is that correct? Sub-Saharan? Okay. Um, and I'm always like, I don't know my geography that well. Um, they are going to be sharing that with a documentary. We're going to have a special luncheon on July 25th. I'm serious, guys. We're feeding y'all all the time. So be ready. Um, so we're excited to have them coming and sharing with us in a couple of weeks. And if you get a chance just to welcome them back, greet them today, they're going to be, we're glad to have y'all here. We love you guys and i um, thankful for y'all. All right, that's all the announcements I had. That was a lot. It's exciting to have so many things going on, though. It's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of you out there. We really um, want to honor you today. And I know that it's a mixed day for a lot of people. Um, maybe you didn't have a great relationship with your father. Maybe your father has passed on. Um, maybe you long to be a father and aren't yet. So we want to acknowledge that there's a lot of, of mixed emotions in that. But I want to just thank the men in our community here. Whether you're a father or not, many of you step into roles to be um, father-like roles for your friends and your family and to fill those roles. And so as I was looking for a liturgy and a prayer to open our service today, I found this beautiful one written um, for the African-American lectionary, and I want to share that with you today and pray a blessing over our fathers and those who serve many of those roles in our community. So pray with me and join me in the amen if you join. The world's human, human community began with one man. The redemption of humanity was wrought by one man. Today, we celebrate the contributions of strong, godly men in our community. We celebrate men who, with the wisdom of Solomon, seek God's perfect plan for their lives and the lives that they influence. We appreciate men who, with the spirit of David, seek repentance as men after God's own heart. We acknowledge men who, with the obedience of Abraham, follow God's direction, help shape the lives of their families, and ultimately change the world. We honor men who, like Peter, are fallible, but passionate about serving the Lord and fervently building his kingdom. As Joseph cared for his father and brothers, we care for the men of our community by generously sharing our resources, our time, and our unconditional love. We pray for men who have the inner and outer strength of Samson, but have lost their way. We're grateful for men who, like the Apostle Paul, teach us Christian principles and values. Today, we celebrate men who strive in all things to be like Jesus, exhibiting his character and his love. O oh God, our ultimate Father, as you have inspired men from the beginning of time to live lives of faith and hope, so now create in our men a new zeal for wisdom, repentance, passionate service, and unconditional love. Grant that our men will be reflections of Jesus Christ, hungering for the word and thirsting after your righteousness. In your blessed name, we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. 
Good morning. I invite you all to stand. I'd like to introduce our um, team this morning. On my right here is Greg. Back here is Kevin. My name is Derek. Um, please join me as we read our call to worship this morning. I'll start us out. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge, till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody.
Would pay 
as uh, they're signed up for discipleship. central text this morning is Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold, Bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So is it with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? 
When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you in all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, on the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. This is the word of the Lord. Steve, good morning all. My name is Chaz. I'm one of the pastors here. And I want to say hi to, uh, well, first of all, happy Father's Day to so many of you. Uh, And then secondly, we um, have an announcement regarding our online uh, community. I know many of you are watching because the bottom dropped out this morning as soon as you got here. So everybody that's here is wet. Uh, But for those who are watching online, we're going to continue this for another year. We just invested some money. uh, The session approved on Tuesday night. Uh, for a company to sort of manage this from afar, from a remote location. So the main reason I'm telling you this is, one, that it's going to continue for a year because there's folks who just physically can't get to church. And then, two, main thing is, is this frees up a man that's back there, one of our most incredible volunteers we have, Nathan White. Um, Nathan is, uh, he served here as an elder faithfully for years, uh, he, but he is, in the last you know, 15, 16 months, he's been here on Friday nights, Saturday mornings. He's here three to four hours on Sunday. It's a lot of work, and this is going to free him up. So give him a big hug or something. You know, he deserves something great for this. There you go. Um, all right, so let's talk a little Haggai. Um, when I was in seminary, uh, I came to the actual seminary. I went to uh, just in the tail end of a big capital campaign uh, where they were upfitting this brand new building. And as the story goes, as legend has it, uh, the previous location where the seminary was housed was like in an office retail space. And apparently, it was completely inadequate. There was just people were on top of one another. There was barely any room. And uh, in fact, professors used to say, you know, we used to have to budget 15 minutes just to get a cup of coffee, you know, uh, because you would stop and run into so many of your friends and students, you know. But they eventually expanded and built this new facility, and at the groundbreaking ceremony, the keynote speaker was Steve Brown. Some of you know who Steve Brown is. He uh, was one of my professors. He's actually one of the reasons I got this job here years and years ago uh, as an author, uh, great, great speaker. And um, he did something unusual and very gutsy. Uh, He got up there, And he told a story and then just sat down, offered no explanation. And the story was this. There's a group of lifeguards off the coast of a very harrowing beach in Australia, uh, just really rough waters. And this group of lifeguards were under-resourced, understaffed, didn't have what they need to get their job done, and yet they had an unscathed record. They were constantly saving people's lives and pulling them out of the water. And on one such occasion, there was a child of a very sort of wealthy local whose child was saved by these lifeguards who just were constantly felt this sense of urgency about their jobs. And so he decided to give a very generous gift to these group of lifeguards, which gave them you know, new posts, new resources, and new, new headquarters, increased the staff, And then that's when the death started happening on their watch. It's a true story. Um, Apparently, after all that happened, what happened is what happens to a lot of us. All of a sudden, good things start to happen to us, which are blessings, wonderful things in our lives. And the next thing you know, it sort of takes this, sort of this complacency sort of settles in. The sobriety of life kind of walks away from us. C.S. Lewis said that pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse the deaf world. And you know what I'm talking about, don't you? There's a sense in which when the bottom just really comes out in our lives, it just demands your fullest attention, doesn't it? I mean, it's like 
If you've ever really been through the valley of suffering, you know it's like smelling salts. You can't help but fall on your knees. It, it sort of it just humbles you and it, it sort of empties you of yourself. And yet when the clouds part and the sun comes out and brighter days are ahead, there's just this weird thing that happens to us, doesn't it? All of a sudden it feels like we're caught adrift of this sort of river of self-reliance and we've we sort of forget what happened and our, our hearts get closed up again, closed off to God and to one another. Uh, it's in a way that suffering and pain is like a brutal teacher. That's something C.S. Lewis said. But when good times happen and we need good seasons, when they happen, it's sort of like summer break where you forget everything you learned from your teacher. That's the context of our Israelites this morning. Uh, it's a ceremony. I know it didn't really stand out in the spirit obscure passage, Okay. But it's a ceremony. They just finished the foundation work and foundation walls of the temple. And they're about to have a celebrating. It's a ribbon-cutting ceremony, you know? And all of a sudden, Haggai gets up and speaks this illustration. And, and, and people are like, what is that? You know, they got their gold shovels out, getting ready to do topsoil work. And all of a sudden, he realizes this is this warning of this thing that we all deal with in our lives. And so here's how we're going to break up this really unique passage. And I know it's weird, but we have to always remember God gives us these passages. It's inspired and it's there for us today. So point number one, the contagion of self-reliance. This is a reality, especially for Westerners. We all deeply struggle with this. Number two, what does it look like in life if we're willing to listen and be humbled by our pain and not just fight it or numb it away or put our bootstraps on to, to, to get out of it? And then lastly, a harvest before harvest. So let's take a look at the first part. And let me just kind of walk us through, again, if you've been and out, because I know it's summertime. Um, and and, and this, this whole book, okay, the book of Haggai, it's a, it's a prophet. It's a, it's a minor prophet. But what's unique about it is it chronicles this period after the bottom fell out for the Israelites. If you don't know much about Jewish history, this is one of the major things that they, like, historically happened to them is for 70 years, seven decades, they had lost their homes, leveled to the ground. The temple was leveled to the ground. They were taken away from Israel into Babylon, where they essentially were sort of slaves there. And this was a hard, hard season of life. But through God's providence, the Persian Empire, and we talked about that a couple weeks ago, rose up, led by this guy named Cyrus, who had a kill him with kindness strategy to take over the world. And he inherited the Israelites when he defeated the Babylonians. And because he inherited them, he wanted to expand his kingdom westward. And so he allowed the Israelites to go back to their homeland to sort of spread the Persian Empire. But he also gave them a blank check, essentially, to build their, the temple. Right? This guy wasn't Jewish. And he, he funds this thing and even says, your God wants you to rebuild the temple. And we've, we've talked about why that's important. The temple wasn't just some sort of building or some sort of structure that they had to have. It was the place where God's intimate, localized presence dwelt with the people. And so when the Israelites decided to build a temple, what they're saying is, we can't do life without the intimate presence of God in us. That we, we are renouncing self-reliance and independence. We are, we're broken. And they did. They came back broken. They were humbled after the exile, uh, eager to rebuild the temple. In the first year, they began work on the foundation. But what we've chronicled, and the reason this book exists and why a prophet went to them, is because after things started to get better, like it happens to all of us, they stopped working on the temple. And that was more than just negligence to build a temple. It was sort of that drifting thing that happens to all of us. It's like, oh, I'm okay now. And I don't feel this pressing need in me. I don't, I don't feel this need and, and sort of this humbled experience where I'm at the end of myself. I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> I'm doing really well. I'm, I'm, we've rebuilt our economy. We're having a little baby boom over here in Israel. Uh, my house is almost finished. We didn't have the temple when we were in Babylon anyway. We really don't need it like this. But what happened is, is and you see it in the elements in here, there's some of our passages just a little bit. Over the last couple years, life started to get hard again. 
Things were bad in, in, in Babylon. They get better at home. And all of a sudden, it starts getting hard again. And you know what happens? Instead of falling to their knees, they do exactly what we often do. You forget the, 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 the suffering, the pain, the lessons you learned in that. Instead of falling to their knees, like to just really humble themselves, they fall to their knees to lace up their bootstraps. And that is one of the hardest audiences to really reach is when you've got these problems, but you're in denial of it. And when you feel self-sufficient uh, to deal with these things, when you sort of just ignore these things that are happening to you, you push them along because you know what, you can manage through it, and you just keep plowing through life. And you work harder because you're like, you know, I don't like this experience that's happening to me. How do I fix it? You know, I know I'll do. I'll just keep turning to myself and keep working, working harder. Well, what this passage, sort of where we join in on it, is after things had gotten really, really hard, they finally actually repent. And they start rebuilding the temple again, and they start just working on the foundation walls. And so they're, they're, they're kind of turning around. But it's still been a really hard season, so they stand in front of this, on, here at this celebration, and it's a ribbon-cutting event, and Haggai comes up to be the keynote speaker, and what he's about to tell them is, I know you've been through a really hard time. I know you've been obedient uh, here to really listen to what God has called you to do to build the temple, but good times are about to come to you. Like, you're about to get into summertime, you know? Like, just a really good season. Like, you're about to have a carefree season when things are just really going to work out well for you. But I'm going to tell you something going to be unpopular right now before it happens to bring a bit of sobriety about you because this good time is about to come, and yet here's these challenges. And so he's like Steve Brown. He tells this weird, obscure illustration. And like some of you are looking at this like, what in the world is this? He says, you know, thus says the Lord of hosts. Ask the priests about the law. Now, so what Haggai does at this event is he speaks directly in front of the crowd to the priests because they're the people who are representing all of the people. And, of course, priests are adept in the law. They're, you know, trained to discourse in it. They they're should be able to answer questions on the fly. And he asks them questions like this. It says, if someone carries holy meat <laughs> in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or or any other kind of food, does it become holy? And they, of course, they answer no. Now, one of the, what he's referencing is the fact that people came, Jewish people came to the temple to offer sacrifices. And some of these, you know, like actually would have leftover pieces of meat, okay? And what do you do with that meat? Because now it's been consecrated as holy. Well, the temple um, was actually not built there. And so there's no place to store this meat. Typically, the priest would live off that, store it somewhere, you know, and eat it. But in this case, there's no Ziploc bags, there's no Tupperware, so they would walk home praying they don't run into a dog with a piece of meat in their robe, okay? Hey, haven't we all been there? Like, walked home from a dinner party with meat in our jacket, you know? And we're like, what do I do? We, come on, we've all been there, right? I mean, this is weird, okay? There's no other way to put it. It's super weird. But it's the reality they faced. They had to walk home with meat that was holy. And the question is, wow, hey, this pot roast, like that's holy now. Well, it wouldn't have been like that, but some sort of cut of meat, okay? It's touched something else. Is it holy? Now, what in the world is the point of that? What he's trying to do, he's trying to flesh out this idea and this challenge, this sort of problem. If you, if you sort of trace the trajectory of the Israelites that they've had and that you and I have this sort of presumptive way that we interface with life. Like this sort of, what the Israelites had struggled with, you know, God had called them to be a holy nation. And we talked a lot about that in the Justice series. What did that mean that, that they would have been a nation set apart as a blessing to the other nations, that if they had really obeyed God's law, there would have been no poverty. I mean, that's how like, amazing this reality was. So of course, they completely neglected that. And they turned inward. And they became all about themselves and the exteriors. And they put a lot of trust in the fact that they were these people that were holy, but they actually weren't living holy. In fact, Jeremiah the prophet, before uh, you know, they went into exile, 
He said to them, he said, don't trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Because he was saying that because they, there's just this sense of like, oh, we'll put our flag out here. We're holy. <laughs> We're in good shape here. Well, the reality is, is this remnant that came from Babylon was headed down that same path. And, and here he is. He's like, they've just turned the corner, you know. They've just repented. They've been humbled again. And he's saying this before the walls have even been framed. And he's saying, I want you to watch out for this. There's this thing that's going to come in your life, and it's already happened. It happens to all of us. Where you're just going to assume this is sort of oozing out of you. Now, why is he bringing this up? Because, look, this is the tendency of the human art. Uh, I'll celebrate 19 years of marriage in August. And um, I took Catherine to this marriage conference before we were married, like 20 years ago. And it was this, the guest speaker uh, was this sort of like Texas pastor who had like all these Texas <laughs> illustrations. And he, he sort of like laid it on to the men. I don't know if you've ever been to something like that where someone like really lets the men have it. Um, but he, he was sort of saying like, men, you got to watch out. Your tendency is to hang your wife on the, on the wall like a trophy, like, you, you know, a five-point buck you once caught, you know, and say, there it is. I did that 20 years ago. I, I won it over and caught it. You know, and it's silly, but it really stuck with me, believe it or not. It stuck with me. Because the reality is, is, you know, I wear a wedding ring. Doesn't mean, there's no indication of what that says about the health of my marriage. There are many a times a spouse has to grab you and say these hard words to you. Dallin, where are you? Where's your head right now? Like, you are so distant. You are not connecting with me. You are, like, your mind and your heart is in, like, another world right now. And so the reality is, like, when a spouse is doing it, they're, they're wanting intimacy. They're saying, here's this reality that already exists. You know, we're married. But, you, but applying that in real life, this is what Haggai's saying to these people. Like, the fact that you'll have the temple one day does not mean you're holy and that you're, you're listening and that you're cultivating an intimate relationship with God. Now, the opposite is true, though, with this whole thing. And I know I'm doing a lot of, like, it almost feels like a class today. I understand that. There's just, it's a t weird passage. We've got to explain it. But he's talking again to these priests, and they understood these things. So put yourself in their position. There's no doc, there's really no doctors, healthcare, antibiotics. The Jewish community had to focus on cleanliness, and there's this reality, if you touch the dead body in the community, you are immediately considered to be unclean so that you didn't contaminate others. You've touched death. And that person would have to literally self-quarantine for seven days, do a ceremonial washing, and then come back. But what is that point is, 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 is during those seven-day period, uh, if you touched a dead body, um, you, everything you did and everything you said at that moment was deemed unclean. He's making this point to say that when they had neglected the temple and when they had turned self-reliant, when they had like basically said, we really don't need God here in our lives that much, he said, that's when you became unclean. That's when almost everything that came out of your mouth became vain and empty, sort of hypocritical things that were disconnected from the reality of what it means to be caught up in like a very intimate relationship with God. You know, I just continue to believe that one of the greatest offenses of Christianity really stems in this area. Now, I'm sure and there are, you know, of course, obnoxious people, very judgmental people. I realize the Christian sex ethic is offensive uh, to many. But I continue to believe what one of the most offensive things Jesus ever said, if we really take him at his word, is when he said to his own disciples, apart from me, you literally can do nothing. And this has been the story since Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden. And this is this sobering, humbling reality of like the true condition of what we are as human beings and how vast of a need we truly have for God. And yet we're constantly ignoring this and constantly just pushing this 
away. I mean, I just, I feel like I should get off stage right now because I feel like a complete hypocrite preaching this right now. I mean, I am like the, the like God's like the horse whisperer to me. And I'm constantly just go, 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 go. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Oh, that hurt. I don't see it. I don't feel it. And all of a sudden just collapse. And it's almost like he nestles up and says, you done? <laughs> Are you going to stop fighting me now? Are you just willing to listen? I, I'm here. And I want to be with you. The challenge is, is this is what we all face. And we all always look to so many things in our lives to sort of get away with that. So let's talk more about reality in our lives. What does it mean then when we have these hard things that happen to us in our lives that we're not just going to push it away, numb it away, ignore it? If we follow the trajectory, if you follow the trajectory of your life, you'll know that in many ways it's actually very functional to have a little bit of everything thrown into your life. A little bit of God here, But also, you know, you follow Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. There's one of those great needs we have, and this is need for comfort and security. And we'll look to almost anything, almost anything to meet that need. Our career, uh, the influence we have uh, in our careers and in social settings, the lifestyle we have, our country, our resources, you know, And the reality is we can get away with this like most of our lives, but you know what happens, don't you? All of a sudden, life is going along and you think everything's going well for you. And all of a sudden, just one of these things that you have been putting your trust in, and you didn't even know it, you've been putting your hope in and that you've been stealing from to sort of fill these needs almost all of your life, and you're good, and you don't even know it, and it's meeting these needs. And all of a sudden, it comes off kilter And all of a sudden, you're completely off the rails. I lived in a fraternity house for three years when I was in college. I became a Christian my first month of college, and then I was this Christian that just lived in my fraternity house. A lot of crazy things happen in a fraternity house, okay? And here I am, this like lone Christian guy, like that would, that was very involved in the fraternity. I held office. I was, I was like, honestly, in many ways, uh, living in a fraternity house as a Christian prepared me more for ministry than anything else. You know, I mean, and I actually didn't even mean that to be funny. Like it just, I, it was like people looked to me like all the time for stuff. But there's this reality is like you're, you're humming along and you got all these guys who are, they're fine. <laughs> like they don't know they have this need. They're comfortable and they're lo- it's obvious to me they're looking to all these different things to make them comfortable. But there's always this one thing that would happen, I notice that would always be an opportunity to door in for me to talk to somebody is when the old girlfriend would break up with a guy. They're doing fine. They're tough. All of a sudden, girlfriend breaks up with them, and they're a mess. Absolute mess. There's this one guy. I literally, like, I had to talk him off the ledge, and I swear he was getting ready to get, he wanted to get baptized that night in a van down by the river or something, you know? Like, he was ready to give his life to Jesus. He was such a wreck. And all of a sudden, a couple days later, she takes him back, and it's like that conversation never happened. And he's back to being this, frankly, a really cocky, like, pompous fraternity guy, you know? There's nothing more certain in this life than, you and, than this, that you and I will suffer And yet, there's nothing more certain in our lives that we will do anything and everything to push that reality away and push it down. The 2019 film, In Life, uh, features, it's written and directed by Terrence Mack, it features, uh, it's a historical drama film, uh, a true story based on true events of this man, Franz Jagerstatter, an Austrian farmer and devout Catholic. Uh, This is a man uh, in his community, he was one of the lone people who refused to join the Nazis, and he fought against it, and the world is starting to get darker and darker, and you can see the Nazi influence keep going and going. And he has this sort of visit uh, with this sort of local painter who painted pictures of Jesus. And, this, and, he, and he's, the, the painter sort of opens up to him, and he says this. He says, I paint all this suffering, and I don't suffer myself. I make a living of it. We don't want to be reminded of it, so we don't have to see what happens to the truth. A darker time is coming, and men will be more clever. They won't fight for the truth. They'll just ignore it. I paint their comfortable Christ with a halo over his head. How can I show what I haven't lived? Someday I might have the courage to venture, but not yet. Someday I'll paint the true 
Christ. The reality is, is God really got the Israelites' attention through pain. And that's a hard reality of life, and it's a question we've answered around here. We'll answer it a little bit more in the fall in our series, um, Hard Sayings of Jesus. Why does God allow suffering and pain into our lives? But one of the things that we can see clearly for today with our people that we're talking about is God allowed pain into their lives in the most loving fashion you could imagine. Is here are these people over and over and over again giving their hearts to the wrong things that are going to break their heart. And he in his loving kindness steps in and allows them to feel the weight of that and takes away a lot of these things. And you can see it here in the passage. He's asking them, look, all these hard things were happening to you. How did you fear? You were placing stone upon stone before all this was happening. And all of a sudden, your crops were not coming in the way they were supposed to be. All of a sudden, storms are coming in. <laughs> you know, if you don't adjust your TV, that's the rain hitting the roof right now. It's super loud. All these hard things are happening to them, and they're just fighting, and they're resisting, and they're pushing it down. And the reality is, we never can really know why in particular we do suffer, but the question is, are we willing, if you're going through something right now, and you're in a lot of hurt, and there's pain, and there's disappointment, are you willing to look at it? Are you willing to ask questions of your pain, and are you willing to listen to the story that what you're, what you're feeling and what your experience is, are you willing to listen to stories trying to tell you and what it's doing? Are you willing to listen to your pain? Because the reality is pain and suffering is something that will never leave you neutral in this life. It can't leave you neutral. It will either bring the, the best parts of yourself out of you, character, hope, patience, kindness. It will just sort of smooth out and polish so many of the rough edges of your character, perseverance, or what it will do if you ignore it and you're not willing to feel it and, and take it to him, it'll leave you cynical, a very closed off heart. It'll make you more isolated, more angry with others, more critical of others. And it shows up, doesn't it? I mean, if that is something you're doing right now, you know it shows up. It shows up in ways you're constantly trying to numb your pain. It shows up in all the anger that's showing up. Your cynicism, you're closing yourself off over and over and over again. You don't want to let anybody really, truly, literally close. Why? Because you've not dealt with it. It's there. And it won't ever go away. It just keeps showing up in all these different things. You know, Anne Von Voskamp, who's been through a lot of suffering herself, recently wrote a blog, and she's just talking about the willingness and the thing that actually these Israelites eventually did do, about when just when suffering and hard times come, just being open-handed to receive it and ask the questions our pain is telling us. And she says this, maybe non-closure is a way to stay open to really living because suffering cracks open the heart to tenderly see and to truly stand with the ache of all humans. Suffering lets the soul see. See the deep suffering around us. See the deep suffering within us. See the suffering Savior who deeply absorbs all suffering and carries us home when there is no, where there is no more suffering forevermore. Suffering doesn't mean you're cursed. Suffering means you're human. Regardless of what Instagram or all the glossy ads are showing, all your suffering isn't some unique anomaly. Suffering is a universal experience of all humanity. And the question isn't, why is there brokenness and suffering in my life? But why wouldn't there be suffering? Because such is life in a broken world. You buy the lie that your life is supposed to be heaven and earth, and suffering can be a torturous hell. But accept and expect that life is a battle, then suffering isn't a problem, but part of earth's topography to cross on our way to heaven. The Israelites traded in their self-reliance and their self-relying ways for wholeheartedness. And this is what God wants from you. Of all things he wants and demands is the wholehearted integration of an intimate relationship with you. And like I said earlier, it's one of the hardest things about following him 
because he will not accept half-heartedness. He wants every bit of you, every aspect. He wants your hopes. He wants your dreams. He wants your struggles. He wants to be in there, in the foxhole, with you, in these deepest, darkest places, and he wants you to be fully known, vulnerable to him. You trace your life and trace the Israelites' history. It's the story of humanity. We fight this almost more than anything else. But here they are, and they finally just surrender. Stone by stone, as they put the wall together, and just that sort of freedom that comes in life, when you just finally stop the fight and you just, you, you just give it up and you confess what's true, what you've always known, your whole life, you need him and you can't do life without him, that you are utterly lost without him and that there is a deep brokenness inside you. As much as you try to fight it, hide it from everybody else, including more than anybody else yourself, there's nothing more free in life when you just tenderly just say, I yield. I yield. So how do we do that? Well, look at this last point here. Now, it's interesting. I'll close with this. It's the month of December here for these folks at this ceremony. And what that means simply is this. The agricultural period is over. They, they planted all their seeds out of the barn. Why? Because it's in the ground. You know, it, they plant it in fall. It's cold. It's winter. And the reality is, life's been really hard the last couple of years for them. And they're probably wondering, you know, here we are, we're giving our lives to God, we're focusing on the temple, we're rebuilding this temple, but they can't help but think about the month of April, too. What's going to happen in April? Are we going to still be going through this hard season? And I get it, I feel like it's been like three years of just a hard season, I'm just longing for a carefree summer, okay? I want that so bad. But the reality is, is they're feeling that. And they're feeling that need is like, is it going to get better? What's happening? And he gives them the hope. He, t- he tells them the very thing that he's also warning them about. Here's what's going to happen. Is a seed yet in the barn? Oh, yes, it is. So is the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree. And right now, they've yielded nothing. But I'm going to tell you, I'm already telling you, a harvest is really coming. From this day on, Your God is literally going to bless you. You're going to have amazing circumstances. But you know what's beautiful about this? There are just times in life you can't receive good news like this. When you're looking to that to fill you and to make all your life, you will be entitled. You won't really say thank you. You'll be nervous. You'll be anxious. You'll be wondering. You'll be counting how many orders in April. Is anything coming out of the ground? What's happening? You'll try to gain control. But when you've been really leveled and come to that place where you just sweetly surrender and good things happen to you, you know what you can do? You can just say, thank you. You can just actually really enjoy it. I mean, really enjoy it in a way that can't be enjoyed when you're looking to it for all your happiness. What is this saying? Is it saying behind every cloudy day is a silver lining? If you pass the test, God will give you good things. No, we're not here to preach the prosperity gospel. What we are saying is what's true of this passage. Good things were getting ready to happen, But guess what? It's also a foretaste of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ (laughs) said, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and he sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds. But when it has grown, it's larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make its nest in its branches. Jesus also said this, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears more, much fruit. He was talking about himself. <laughs> this kingdom that he inaugurated 2,000 years ago began with him and these lowly little disciples. That this little seed in the ground, this tiny little insignificant event that was happening outside the walls of Jerusalem, this man who had come had been rejected by his own people, by his own closest friends, thought to be a fool, who even is dying at the very last moments of life, and it feels like he's, he's sort of rejecting God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's he doing? He's playing the seed into the ground of this sure promise that it is absolutely true if you're a Christian. The seed is out of the barn, and it is in the ground, and it rose again on the third day. 
to a new world that Jesus Christ began because he died. Your sins, you've been buried with him in Christ. Your sins have been buried. They've been removed. But you've been risen to new life in Christ. And the promise is true that whatever good times you're in right now or challenging times are in, the best is absolutely yet to come with this kingdom coming in all its fullness. And what that means right now is whatever you're going through, you can either feel the pain and not ignore it and walk through it the way you really need to. Or if you're going through a really good time, you can really say thank you and drink to the very bottom of the dregs of it in a way that you couldn't if you hadn't suffered before because of this promise that Jesus Christ has come, he has died, he has resurrected, and he is alive again. Father, we, we do want to just stop and just ask supernaturally that you would do this thing. You do it in my heart. I'm tired of fighting so often with you. I give up the fight and I go back to it again. I know it's all true for all of us. There is this beautiful thing that can really happen in our lives if we're just willing to yield, not grab hold of everything we have and feel like we can't let go of, that we can just sweetly surrender because you're better. Things in your hands are better than our own. You love us in sickness and in health, plenty and in want. You have not abandoned us wherever we are. Lord, so whatever season we might find us, if we're in the middle of summer but our lives feels like we're in the middle of winter, or if we're in the middle of winter and it feels like summer, Lord, help us to embrace whatever it is and to know the truth that life with you is better than without you. That apart from you, we absolutely can do nothing. And so we want to ask and pray in Jesus' name that we would receive this reality, that we want all of you and all of our hearts and every aspect of our lives. And if there are things that we're fighting right now, Lord, that you and your kindness would release that grip and set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. I you to stand and join us in worship.
seals mercy in part and righteousness
Amen. You may be seated. Music causes us to celebrate. That's what we're going to do. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table here. Um, here's how we're going to do it. I'm going give you some instructions because we're going to... Uh, we've done it a lot of different ways in the last year, haven't we? But uh, we're going to come forward and then you're going to t- receive the bread and the juice and then and then... Take the elements right on the spot here as you have it. So uh, we'll have two stations, one here and one over here. So like this group right here, you're, you're going to go clockwise. So you're going to come you're gonna come down here, this section. We'll come down here and then go back to your seats that way, all right? Come down here, eat and drink, at the, and then go back. And then this group will do the same thing, all right? Should I go out this way? You can come to either station for the for this group, okay? And then you'll go back to your seats that way, okay? This group will go out that way, come to this station, and then go back that way. Do you have that? Okay. All right. Uh, and I, I don't realize that we're uh, time-wise we're running a little bit late here, but don't as you come to this to take it, you know, don't don't rush. Uh, if you want to take a moment to pray, reflect. All right. Uh, I just want to, I want to say three quick things, it'll be quick, three quick things to connect this, what we're doing, with the passage in Haggai chapter 2, all right? The first thing is that this is a consider time. Three times Haggai said, consider, consider, consider. Isn't this a consider time? Remember, examine, discern. This is a time for us not to rush through. This is a time for us to reflect, to consider back our sins, forgiveness, looking to the future. Secondly, this is a t- it's a temple time. Thought about that? This is a temple time. The temple is where the glory of the Lord is present. The glory of the Lord is present here at this table in us and among us, it's a temple time. Think on that. The Lord is present here in what we're doing. The third thing is, this is a from this day on time. Okay, from this day on, he mentioned that several times, right? From this day on, it, from this day on, I will bless you, okay? For those of you who come in faith, and do this, you are blessed. This is a time in which you are blessed because Christ's work has been finished. Nothing more to be done. I am blessed today. As you hold that cup, which in 1 Corinthians 10, he calls it a cup of blessing, right? This is a day, from this day on, I'll be blessed. Let me read the words that we, we read From 1 Corinthians, you know these words well, but listen. On the night which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have the deacons come, and then you'll do that, come down here, consider the glory of the Lord is present from this day on, and right now on this day, you're blessed. Let's pray. Lord, well, we've gone through this ceremony so many times, and sometimes we just do it in a thoughtless way. Help us not to do that today. Thank you that we come to this table 
we lay aside our self-reliance and we come humbly before you with open hands only to receive you and to receive your blessing. May we do that in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Deacons would come.
Amen. What a glorious time. Michael, you want to come send us out with a word of blessing? From this day on, I will bless you. And we close our service with, with a word of blessing. Nice. I was going to jump, but I didn't know how that was going to end. Well, I think I know how it was going to end. You know, thank you, Chaz, for that word. Because I was thinking last night the grilled Wagyu burger I had on the lake was a holy moment. And it made me holy, possibly. But being with you guys this morning and celebrating church and the word of the Lord and this meal together is a holy moment. So thank you guys. The benediction for this morning is from number 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Happy Father's Day. Blessings to everybody. Thank you.